let me say a word in defense of reason in dialogue with faith. Because faith is that proof. Faith unites us to that substance. But reason, in order to realize its full potential, needs the horizons revealed by and truths contained in the faith. And not just any faith, but the Catholic faith. Well, it's really nice to be here in Steubenville at Franciscan University. I visited here a number of times. Uh, Dr. Steve Crayson, who's the founding president of the Society of Catholic Social Scientists, uh, often has the annual conference of the society here. So it's always nice to come. And there's lots of friends in the audience. So for me, this is a bit of a treat. Well, tonight we're going to talk on the vocation of marriage and its contribution to society. And I'm going to do it from the perspective mainly of a social scientist. My undergraduate degrees were, by, I had double majors. One was sociology, the other was social administration. And minors in psychology that went on into graduate work and for professional psychology and spent oh, 14, 15, 16 years doing that. And then switched into public policy, uh, which I, I really loved being a therapist, but I saw what was happening to family in the United States. Oh, right, well, right across the world. And figured that in the US was probably the best place, rather than going back home to Ireland, but the US was probably the best place to help generate the debate and the correction on what was going wrong in family. And started off mainly being disturbed by what government was doing, because I saw it as a therapist. I saw the effects of family planning, federal family planning, in families that I was doing therapist, uh, therapy with. And I said, this is crazy. And I'm in the craziness business. That's what psychologists are for. You know? <laughs> and the biggest craziness is up there on Congress Hill, the Hill. So that's what motivated the switch into public policy. And as a result, there dealing with macro data, I began to use a lot to go back to draw on my sociology undergrad. It became very, very helpful. So that's what we'll draw on here. But interspersed and framing the whole thing actually is by Catholic faith. Um, the church, God, the Bible, natural law, the church's teaching give us insights on human nature you can't get anywhere else. Uh, it's the richest repository. And for a social scientist actually then it gives you all sorts of hypotheses that you already know the answer to theologically and philosophically, but now you have to find does that hold in the data? And it's very interesting, actually. I found it's not just a slam dunk. Sometimes the data has corrected me. Somehow or another, I got things wrong. I thought natural law was something, but the data causes me to go deeper because I said, uh-uh, that data doesn't fit. But it didn't fit with the paradigm I had in my mind, but didn't contradict reality. And natural law is nothing but the description of reality, of the reality where God made us. So I have found being a social scientist a, a great profession to be in. Um, and I think there's a great future for it. So maybe some of you here will go on and get PhDs in sociology or things like that. People think you're crazy, but I think you're doing fine. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna start off with a basic framework called the five, of society itself. And then we're going to lead back into marriage and then back out again. We're going to be going up and down this, this hill. Five basic institutions in society. They've been there since prehistory. Anytime you dig into it. Not as articulated or as uh, specialized as they are today, but they're all there. Family, there since the beginning of man. Church, the worship of God, the consideration of the transcendentals, all those things. School, education, Every parent tries to pass on to his children and the community tries to pass on because you need kids to be able to run the community as best they can. So that's education, marketplace, even prehistoric men needed food, shelter, um, clothes, and barter and trading, all of that started. And then government. And government is essentially the way I describe it. It's the organization of the community 
to protect the common good. It's, it's mainly protective and it harnesses force. So the three of these institutions, family, church, and school, are person-forming institutions. They're mainly oriented towards the person. The marketplace and government, they're not oriented towards the person. Like if you think even of justice, you know, the, the good symbol of justice is blind. You see the justice, the way scales, and the lady with the, the blindfold. It's not, a, it does, it, when justice is good, of course it adapts to the person. But it's blind, it's much more instrumental. So you've got those two divisions of the instrumental um, institutions, government and marketplace, which is about goods and services. Uh, all of these tap into and are built around fundamental capacities that we have. Family comes out of the sexual capacity that every man and every woman has. Church comes out of our capacity to think, to reflect, to be in awe of, to wonder about, uh, contemplation. School, our intellect, learning, and teaching. Actually, school is always a, almost always a two-way street, teaching and learning. Marketplace, the capacity to work, productivity is the core. After that then comes exchange and all the other things, but the first and fundamental capacity is the capacity to work. Uh, you either have to work to sow, to reap, to do all the things, or else you do part of that and then you, ex you barter and exchange. And then government, there's a, at the core of organized government is force. Just think of one way to actually get to that. Every boundary, every national boundary is there by force of arms. There's not a country in the world where the boundaries have not been laid down by force of arms, and some are still in contention, they always are, and they shift by force of arms almost all the time. And then if you get down to government at the local level, you got the police, the courts, the jail, <laughs> they're all part of the harnessing of force. For what? To protect the common good. It's, it's there mainly to protect. There are some other things there where it may get into developing the common good. So there are capacities. These capacities and these tasks are not there just at the societal level. Every single person in this room has those same five tasks. Task of family, church, school, marketplace, and government. At the individual level, government starts with self-control, governing yourself. Um, you say family, well, you know, clearly for celibates, they deliberately give up family some, to live in community, but mainly to serve others. So in this, it has that same animus of service. Most of us are called to serve our spouses and our children first and foremost. Now, those same tasks actually are there for a couple. And I'd love to develop a pre-Cana marriage preparation course on couples working through these five aspects of married life, talking it through in advance. Task of family. What's your impression of it? What's the, the, you know, the, the engaged couple? Making sure they get on the same track. Work out all the stuff, the big things in advance so that they're not uh, going to be disappointed with the person they married and find out later uh, something they could have found out before. Family, church, school, your own and your children's, education, what is it, what, 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 marketplace, how are you going to divide up your resources, do both of you work, this ha half time, whatever, you know, the whole thing of savings, of purchasing a home, who's going to, graduate studies or not, all of these are market issues. And then government, government of the couple, by the couple, for the couple. <laughs> And where does freedom come in here? Where, what, and I think the way to describe it, think of it as what are the boundaries that must not be violated by which we can really trust each other? Lay those down in advance, articulate them. And then you can be totally free to do all sorts of other things. Huh? Uh, so the, you can see where that sort of course would go. Anybody wants to sign up, wait till I um, retire and get to teaching this course. 
Okay, we've, oh, I'm going backwards there. Hmm. Now, from these fundamental tasks of the couple, then you get into actually the, the family, the kids. When the kids come along, they learn these tasks. The more articulate, or, and they don't even have to be articulated, but uh, the better the parents are at performing these five tasks with each other and in the family, the kids just absorb them by osmosis. That's probably the case with most of you here. You come from good families. And the fact that you're at Steubenville, you know, I'm sure that's the case for everyone here. You will have learned. If your parents are, have these five tasks well in hand and deliberately make sure they get done, you will have absorbed this by osmosis growing up, and it's a tremendous gift to you. So you can see then, uh, up above, if you look, the child, you start off with the couple, then come the kids, and then the kids grow up in that, and then by age 17 or 18, you know, just before you came here, about to be released on the world, you already have a lot of these capacities well developed. Not all of them, for instance, the sexual, no, but I'm sure a lot of you are looking around for, maybe not looking around, but being inspired say, oh, there's someone I could marry, and no, 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 and all the rest. So that's going on here all the time. It does at colleges, it's part of, um, I, I've heard it said of colleges like this, this and University of Dallas, I remember one, one man saying, well, I've sent my daughters there, it's a good place to find a husband. <laughs> and he's right. <laughs> okay, the fundamental needs of society actually are, correspond to these things too. If you go to family, society has to continue. And it, it happens through children. And if you know children, it dies out. Japan is dying out. Japan will not be there 100 years from now. I don't know what will, but not Japan as we know it, because it's, it just doesn't have the kids. It's going to collapse. Um, Spain, Italy, and Greece, same thing. As, they're well on their way to the same thing. Um, so the next generation, uh, society needs it. We all need actually family church. Everybody grapples with the meaning of life. Is there right and wrong? Is there life after death? Does God exist? And that's the work of being religious, of orienting yourself to these big things and living within that all-encompassing framework of meaning. Family, church, school, education, well, there's the need to know. And now at the university level, particularly very well developed in modern times, maybe hyper developed, is knowing more and more about the physical world with the great advances in, in science, that's great. I think we've lost a lot of the capacity to know other things. Universities were much more demanding um, in the past. Um, what they demanded of, of children, what the whole, not just universities, the whole education system demanded a much deeper knowledge of the humanities than modern life does. So we gain some, but we're losing some. And Steubenville is working towards the perfect balance, I'm sure. Material goods, obviously every, every society, every person, every couple, every community needs material things. And then everybody also needs safety. That's the first thing you expect of government, is safety. Um, and that's why government has to harness force to provide safety, which is also one of the reasons why you've got to be very careful, because government having a monopoly, if not a monopoly, a near monopoly on force, you must have a just government, because you definitely don't want force of arms in the hands of somebody who's going to use it unjustly. And that's the, always the big danger. Okay, so there you have it, the way society grows. A couple comes together, kids come, and they're given out at age 17, 18, 19, 20 to society to then gradually take over and repeat the cycle. That's another way of looking at, think of this uh, here as a, an iceberg. We talk a lot about government and the marketplace. You open up the newspaper tomorrow and the vast majority of the front page is going to be government and marketplace or through the newspaper. Underneath all that, however, are the institutions of family, church, and school, which are mainly person-centered, people-forming. This is the 
the level of the iceberg below the water, but the vast bulk of society and the vast bulk of its work as well goes on there. And I want to come back to this one later. If you, I've inverted the pyramid here for one reason, actually. If you go back down through all of these, all of the institutions essentially grow out of the family. And within the family itself, you actually have all five institutions. Within the company, you've got all five institutions. So everything else is very dependent on the family. And the marketplace of government is totally dependent on the people that the family presents and, as it were, moves into the marketplace of government. So the strength of people gives you the strength of the marketplace of government, or the weakness of people gives weakness in the marketplace of government. But come down through that, you come right back down to the family. And then within the family, how does it start? Well, it starts when man and woman, husband and wife, hopefully, come together in the intimate sexual act, which is just to be explored in the way a number of theologians are exploring this. This is one of the huge things Pope John Paul II has set in motion with the theology of the body. But in that act, the new person is brought into being. And all of society actually hinges on the sexual act. It's central not only to society, it's central to all of creation. If you go back and you ask, why did God, what was God about when he started the world? And then the fall came, and then you had Adam and Eve, and they fell, and then, and he promised a redeemer, and then you had Abraham, and then Moses, and then David, and the prophets, and all the rest, and then our, finally our Lord comes, God the Son comes down on earth, redeems us, the church begins, and it brings you right up to now, and 20, 30 centuries from now, it'll still be going. Who knows when the end will come, and I'm quite sure it's a long, long way away. None of us know, our Lord said, not even the Son knows. And Scott Hahn here or some others can, but that's always intrigued me. He said, anybody who, who pretends to know when the end is coming, uh -uh, I think they're. But all that's been set in motion by God. To what end? Finally, it's going to collapse, it's, it's, it's going to end. What's the purpose of doing it all? What's God's purpose? To have a huge, big family with him in heaven forever. All of whom, except God the Son, and then some poor people in modern times with bad technology, but all of whom have come into existence through the sexual act. The sexual act is central, not only to society, but to God's whole design for all of creation right at the core, man and woman coming together sexually. It's huge, and we come back to that in its implications. So in terms of relationships, the marital relationship is the foundational one also for all of society. All other relationships come out of that. The strength or weakness of relationships. The triangle underneath, by the way, relationships are strong to the extent, if you look at the social science data, they get stronger and stronger the more that people worship God. You can see it in the national data. The more that people worship and pray, by and large, the stronger their marriage. And that's common sense when you think about it. You'll find that the same yourself. And the strength of the child, the child who comes out of that, the strength of the child is essentially parallel to the strength of the marriage relationship. When you're married, or if you're married, but we say to most of you here, when you're married, Pay first attention to your spouse before the kids. Now, ladies, the danger for you will be to put the kids ahead of the husband. And guys, the danger for us is to put the work ahead of the spouse, or the work ahead of, that's the default for male and female, for the man out into the workplace, for the woman into her kids. Both of them are going the wrong direction, both. First place, towards each other. You can see this. I learned this as a young therapist. Let me tell you a, a, an anecdote. By the third year, without going through the whole thing, by the third year I'd figured out 
uh, how to do therapy with kids in mid-childhood. Here's the way it went. Kid would be referred, wouldn't see the kid until I could get the whole family in. This is early 70s up in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. Most families were intact. I wouldn't see the kid until dad could get in. I wouldn't see him the first time. There were two or three men I had to do a bit of tussle with that eventually came down, look, if you're not prepared to look, come in for your kid, and you want me to take care of him, you get here or there's no care for your kid for me. You know, it got tough. The Irish chalet that came out. And then the guy came in. That only happened two or three times. Okay, had this, all the family is there, three, four, five sessions to get a sense of what's going on. I keep the focus off the kid, onto the family, get to know what's going on between the parents. Session five or six, I'd say to them, why don't we leave the kids at home next time? I already had a sense of where the conflicts were between the parents. Work on that, heal the conflicts, get them together never had to treat any of the mid-childhood kids. Their symptoms disappear when the parents get back together again. And you just think about it back. Mom and dad get upset, what happens to the kids? Mom and dad start fighting in front of the kids, what happens? Okay, if that's going on all the time. So the strength of the marriage relationship is the key. That's the soil and the sun within which the kids grow. To drive the point home sometimes that you can benignly neglect your kids if you take great care of your spouse. Now, couples who take great care of each other are not going to neglect the kids, but the emphasis has got, should be there. Okay. When mom and dad are in conflict, you got a kid who's split. Actually, I found talking there about the kids that I did in therapy, if the child with the symptoms was, you know, 10, 11, 12, it didn't necessarily happen. They needed extra therapy because they'd been too long, as it were, bent within the conflict of the parents. But the parents getting back together had a huge beneficial effect. Now, what's been happening in our country? This is looking at uh, from 1950 to the year 2000. The green is the out of wedlock birth and the pink is the parents splitting in divorce. And that's up to the year 2000. That broken line you see above at the top is the beginning of cohabitation, which we didn't have any data for, and it's very hard to track. So things have gradually been getting worse. In 1950, for every 100 kids born, 12 kids that year entered a broken family. 3 4% by out-of-wedlock birth, 8 by their parents divorcing. By the year 2000, oh, it was, well, it was up to, well, since then, we've derived a much better method, and I can tell you now that by age 17, the latest year we have good data for it is two years ago, 2010-11. Only 45% of American kids reach age 17 in an intact married family. 55% of American kids, their parents have split. For blacks, it's 16.8, only 16.8. American Indians, 24%. Hispanics, 40, 40. Whites, 52. Asian Americans, 64. What we can say about American men and women in American culture is the vast majority of adult American men and women can't stand each other. And we can get back to that. What's underneath that uh, thing? Things. Now, here's one of the indicators. This is from uh, our best national survey. For all these data that you'll see here are national uh, survey data. This is taking women who are aged 30 to 44. It's from a fertility survey, 14 to 44. But we take them from age 30, so they've lived something. And we look at, the st are they still at a stable marriage depending on the number of sexual partners they've had in their life? The woman who has had zero partners other than her husband, being totally monogamous, those women without knowing anything else, 80% of them are in an intact, stable marriage. With one extra partner, and for most women that happened before marriage, either through high school, college, or young professional days, one extra partner. It drops from 80 down to 54. And with two, it drops down to 44. The average 20-something-year-old 
American today has had at least, on average, two sexual partners already. And many have more. You can see from that, man and woman are designed to be monogamous. And actually that happened, all, not automatically, because there was tremendous culture built up. But Christian culture, over the centuries, gradually formed societies where it was just expected that you didn't fool around before marriage. Sure, everybody was tempted, and some people gave in, but those who did actually were probably getting close to married, and that's where you had shotgun marriages that weren't too bad, because the couple were probably going to get married in any case, they jumped the gun a bit. But today, in our whole culture today, that's not the situation at all. And you can see what's going to happen to marriage. You know, one, two, three, four, but the huge drop off, the biggest drop off at all, is from monogamous to one extra partner. Now this chart, to me, is the single most powerful and important chart in all the social sciences. Because it indicates what's happening, what will happen down at that most fundamental relationship in society. And you can see also the intimate connection of how the sexual is handled. So those two, marriage actually, marriage is the institution for the expression of things sexual. Expression of things sexual outside of marriage is against human nature. Now we're all tempted, but, but that's what it's designed to do. And well-functioning societies have set up cultures that really powerful shepherding and sanctions against sex outside of marriage. Um, you see it in primitive cultures, you see it in uh, so-called advanced cultures. Shepherding the sexual, particularly, where does it come into operation most? Teenagers, because prior to teen, the sexual isn't there. Teens, it begins to blossom. They're not used to handling it. So, you know, there's very definite strictures. And in different societies, they've, different cultures, they've different ways of, of doing that. Remember in Spain, they'd have the chaperones, you know, you didn't date, but there was somebody along with you. And somewhere else in Ireland, it was very different, but still there was those strong sexual norms necessary for society. So looking at marriage and family, if you look at it from a big societal picture, actually take the example of the, um, of the farmer. There's a time to sow, there's a time to grow, there's a time to reap, and there's a time to rest. That happens naturally in the cycle of farming. And if the farmer doesn't observe the cycles, sow at the right time, let the growing happen, make sure the soil is right, reap at the right time, let the land rest at the right time. If he doesn't do that, fairly quickly his farm will be bankrupt. It, they're absolute fundamentals. Spain, Italy, and Greece are in deep trouble these days, we know economically, because, you don't see this written up, because they're not paying attention to this fundamental cycle. They're not marrying, or not marrying till way later, and they don't have children. One, they've been trading places with each other for the last 20 years for the lowest fertility rates in the world and they're now reaping the harvest. Their, their economy, they're just, they're just slowing down and they're getting thinner and thinner. And at the rate they're going, they're going to be out of existence. France too, it's hard to get French data, but other peoples are coming in. Was it Father Groeschel? I remember hearing him on something and I'm sure he had his, his data. Uh, he said that the migrations of people in modern times into Europe and across the world, but he was talking particularly about Europe, dwarf what happened by seven times what happened in the third and fourth centuries in Europe when the Vandals, the Huns, and the Visigoths came into Italy and France and all the rest. That was massive migrations and you see what that did to Europe. What's happening today it dwarfs that by an order of seven, he said. Now he's not a great demographer but I'm trusting that his data was good. <laughs> a great pastor, uh, but however, I'm sure he's right. Now, in social terms and in societal terms, where all this leads actually, the big, the th two big capacities that are developed within the family of, 
of the sexual and love together built on a sacred order where that's within the minds and hearts of the, of the couple. So all of that played out. You get a tremendous strength in the family and would multiply that by millions of times, you get a tremendous strength in the society. Now we have increasing problems across all the five basic institutions. And if we want to know how to save America or any other society, there's one fundamental recipe. And it'll take care of everything except foreign policy. And even there it might, it might have big effects. And that is you grow the young, intact, married family that worships God weekly. Do that, it takes care of the economy, it takes care of one thing after another, after another, after another. People who are married and worship. Let's see if I can get some of the, uh, jump down here a bit. Do it now. No, it's not there. However, let me use my hands. If you take from national federal data and you look at an outcome by family structure, and let's say grade point average, I think I've got some of these here, yeah. Or let's hear, we're looking at income. There's income. By family structure, that's the median income for married uh, step families, that's probably divorced or cohabiting, remarried, split and remarried. Cohabitation, divorced, separated, widowed, and never married. That's the annual average annual income. You can see the impact marriage has. Kids of married families versus all these other family structure. Grade point average, highest in the, in the married family, and then it's lower in the others. Take any outcome, that happens time after time after time again. Every single measure ever done at the macro level, the intact married family is the strongest. Now, if you look at the same people and look at the same measures, but this time look at it by frequency of religious attendance. Take grade point average in the United States from the best survey we have. Those who worship weekly, teenagers who worship weekly, highest grade point average. A couple of times a week, or sorry, a couple of times a month. A couple of times a year and never. It's linear down. You tend to get that same, the slope isn't always the same, but you get that same order all the time. The strongest is always those who worship weekly. Combine both and here's the way it goes. If you get the intact married family that worships weekly, and the intact married family doesn't worship at all, you get strength and it'll be lower here. And then behind this one, you have now, this is the intact married family that worships weekly. The broken family that worships weekly will be lower and sometimes much the same as the intact that doesn't worship. And then the broken family that doesn't worship at all will be the lowest. On every outcome you measure, broken family, doesn't worship, lowest on every outcome, intact married family that worships weekly, strongest on every outcome. That holds across the United States on every measure anytime it's looked at. So, ergo, Mr. President, Congress, local mayor, Governor of the state, you want to improve things, you want to make it stronger, grow the young, intact, married family that worships God weekly. That's not biblical, though the Bible says it. That's social science data. This is what I love about the social sciences. They illustrate divine natural law. They cannot but, the social sciences, well done, can't but do that. Okay, here's a couple of illustrations. Ah, look at this, median net worth in the, in the country. Married family, this is a married family with kids under 18. By the time these couples are around my age, there's a lot more savings, so this gets even bigger and bigger, the difference. Because you're saving for old age, which is coming. Huh? Okay, you can see there the net worth of the family. Where do you think stockbrokers sell their stocks? Where do insurance men sell their insurance? Where is the capital infrastructure of the United States? It's in the married family. And not even Wall Street has copped onto this yet. I bet you stockbrokers, would you say that? I don't know if they go after it, but if you say that, they'll immediately recognize it. A lot of them may base their careers on it. Same with insurance men. Maybe even the same with real estate agents. Children in poverty, the very opposite. Ah, here's a neat one. A colleague of mine, when I was at Heritage, Robert Rector did this work. 
We took uh, from the a census survey all the kids in poverty in single parent families, which was the overwhelming number of kids. From this survey, we were able, their single parent families, we were able to identify the parent, the fathers. So you take, there are 3.93 million kids in poverty, below the poverty line. Identify the fathers and marry the two digitally on the computer. Combine the income and that blue block move out of poverty or move above the poverty line just by marriage alone. So anybody who wants to solve poverty better have marriage as a key kernel strategy or they're about something else. They're not about that. This is very interesting actually, the incarceration rates and um, you can find all this sort of stuff on our website, marry.us, there's a PowerPoint thing or PowerPoint tab we have and all these data are there if you ever want to look them up. The very interesting thing here is look at the last two. The kids who are incarcerated most come from father and stepmother families. They're the highest. The second highest is mother and stepfather families. And then it's a single parent family and then you're down to the, um, the intact married as the correspondent. That, that, that one really struck me because normally you see the single parent family way out there. But in this case actually with the incarceration, um, and we can talk about that further and why. Feminists have the patriarchal family, abuse and all the rest, totally wrong. Safest place for a woman is in marriage. The more you move outside of marriage, the greater the violence against women. That's from the National Crime Victimization Survey. We had great fun conducting a debate with the Department of Justice who said we were violating the data and the feminists who came after us and said, joining us, and then we just released all the data and our methodology and everybody shut up. It's good, robust data. The safest place for women is in the intact married family. Um, the same is true actually for kids by far. The violence against kids, physical violence is about 10 times higher in the cohabiting family, mother and a boyfriend who's not the father. Uh, sexual abuse is almost 20 times higher the more you move away from the intact married family. That's the grade point average by family structure I was talking about earlier. Number of sex, this is church attendance. Well, this is a common sense one. The more that girls would go to church, the less likely they are to become sexually involved. This one is coming back, hearkening back to the sexual partners in a lifetime. The number of sexual partners is linked massively to abortion. For all my life, all my professional life in, in Washington, and some of my best friends are leaders in the pro-life movement, but I've always had, never fully happy with it. Because underneath it is how the sexual, you can't overcome abortion unless you tackle the sexual simultaneously. You want to eliminate abortion, what you really get back is a culture of chastity. If you have a culture of chastity, you won't have abortion. Try to eliminate abortion itself head on. It's good, everything that's going on, but there's, I think people are afraid to tackle the issue of contraception. That's really what's my own personal. Out of wedlock births, it's a natural, that's chart you've already seen before. So what I'm coming back to here at the national level is this. But it's not just at the national level, actually. This is your own personal life. Your strength, your future as an individual. If your vocation is marriage, your future as an individual is linked to your marriage, just as much as your kid's future is linked to the same marriage. You're going to be as strong or as weak as your marriage is strong or weak. And there's an analog there, and it's only an analog, and we leave Scott Hahn and theologians to play it out. But man is made in the image and likeness of God. And God is a community of three. In intimate, the most intimate, it's way beyond our capacity even to begin to comprehend the intimacy between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
in the family you can see a three. Mom, dad, and the child. And the closer the intimacy, the closer the relationship, the stronger everyone is. That's what we're called to. And it, actually in doing that you'll die to yourself. But in dying to yourself you'll grow more. So there'll be more of you. So you'll, you'll gain yourself by dying to yourself. Your future, your child, your family, your grandchildren, your community, everything depends on your marriage. Which is the institution designed to harness the sexual. And if we leave it, what's, and this opens up, and there are others much better qualified to talk about it than me, but the difference actually between the sexual and the childbearing, like the, the sexual is really meant to give meaning to love in marriage. It's the dimension by which the meaning of our love is shown. But the sex, that's not what the, the end of the sexual, of course, the, the purpose for it being there is the child and the continuance of the human race and more kids with God in heaven forever. So the meaning is slightly different from the, the purpose. I'm going to leave others to explore that. But you can see that actually. When you're thinking of somebody that you would like to court or you wish they would court you or go on to marriage where you're attracted and then maybe falling in love, the sexual is the means by which you express the love. Now, you can't express it too much before you're married, <laughs> even though you may want to. But you can do it even holding hands can be sexual, and we know it is. And it's lovely to do, but it's quite legitimate and chaste and all the rest. But that's the beginning. The sexual is, is the way to show the love. But then its purpose is way beyond us in our children. All of this actually leads to two very different ways of society being built. This is a, a bit of a conceptualization. I'm going to wrap up here and then we'll open to the rest of the time to Q&A. Myself and some colleagues were building a, a model of how society works. Economists have these econometric models of the economy. Increased taxes, productivity goes up and all the rest. We're building one out from census data of how society works. And at the core of it, is the family. And what we realized when we were building it out, if you take that green one, they're both the same thing. They're illustrating the three dimensions of a cube. And the one going up is more God, more worship of God. The one coming out on the bottom is increased marriage, more marriage in society. And then the other one going out on the bottom, the other direction, is more kids, more children. So a society that has more worship, more marriage, and more children. If you go from the bottom and gradually go up, you get more and more of each, of all three. Or in the brown one, if you start at the top and start sliding down, you get less worship, less marriage, less kids. And what you have there are two very different models. One showing, and this dawned on us after we, we wrote this out. So wait now, that's a model of the two great commandments. Love God and love your neighbor. Your closest neighbor being in the family, your spouse and your kids. And the other is actually anti-God, anti-neighbor. Less worship, less marriage, less kids. Which model do you think is the one that the church built? And which model is the one that some a lot of people are either falling for or pushing today? This is what's in contest for our society. At the core of it, however, that top point, the young, intact, married family with kids that worship God, not only weekly, but daily and all the time, but at least weekly. Huh? Okay, we'll open it up for questions. Thank you.